Divine Truth Paget Messages Discussions Discussions of individual messages received by James Paget between 1914 and 1923 from large variety of spirits. This is session 4, part 2 of the discussion How Divine Love Enters the Human Soul where Jesus and Mary continue discussing how divine love enters the human soul and the three parts of the human by focusing on the second part of the message from Jesus on the subject given to James Paget on the 8th of May 1916. The session was recorded on the 26th of July 2017 from 11.30 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Okay. okay. So, I've also said, what are called moral deeds and good thoughts will not cause this inflowing of the divine love, because these things are necessary steps towards the purification of the soul in its natural love, and yet, no matter how pure this love, the natural love may become, yet it is not the divine love or any portion of it. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking about some things that are a bit more important Mm -hmm. because they do allow for the development, whereas rituals don't allow for any development yep. and frequently inhibit development. Yes. But morals and ethics do certainly allow for development, mm -hmm. right? Particularly, and as I've stated here, development of the natural to the perfect natural man. Yeah. Very, very concerned about morals and ethics yes. to develop to the perfect natural man. So, so now morals and ethics do have some efficiency, some effectiveness yep. with regard to our development, but they still will not guarantee reception of God's love. Mm -hmm. But they can have other good effects. Yes. So at least, so if you're involved in living a moral and ethical life, right, and not even believing in God at this point, you are going to do better mm -hmm. than a religious person who is actually believing in ritual, saving them. Mm-hmm. And, and does not pay regard to morals or ethics. Yes. Yeah. And particularly when, when it comes to following, say, a book like the Bible, allowing things like wars, allowing things like punishing children, allowing things, you know, allow, even allowing the belief that if you, as long as you have the sacrament every week, you will be saved. Yeah. None of these things will ever come out to be right. And some of them are extremely bad for humanity. Mm -hmm. And, and therefore will have a penalty associated with them with when it comes to God's correction. Yeah. Whereas if you become a moral and ethical person, there is no penalty associated with being a moral and ethical person. <laughs> and in fact, there are a lot of rewards, rewards for being a moral and ethical person, particularly after you pass. Now, on Earth, there's not a lot of rewards from humankind, mm -hmm. oftentimes, because a lot oh, of people... Sometimes there Sometimes is. there is yeah. and sometimes there isn't. You know, it depends where you're living and what... Yeah. So, you know, like, if you're living with a religious person, you'll find that <laughs> being moral and ethical might challenge them a lot, right? But, yeah. um, but there might not be a lot of rewards in your human life, but there will be large rewards in, mm -hmm. in the life after this one. Mm -hmm. oh, so, so the beauty of moral... moral deeds and good thoughts and ethical behavior is that it does have some efficiency mm -hmm. it, it does have some effectiveness in improving your condition but it still doesn't help you receive god's love well you say it he it's these are the necessary steps towards purification of the soul in its natural love correct does that process the steps of purification of the soul in natural love does that form any part of the preparation that we talked about yesterday? Well, it, it can help, but to be frank, there are many billions of spirits now in the sixth dimension of the spirit world who have never received divine love, who are now completely ethical, completely moral, mm -hmm. and always think good thoughts. Yeah. So it's not helping them. Mm -hmm. So... So, so while it can have or can have uh, allowance of an opening, obviously, if you have bad thought, evil thoughts all the time and no morals and no ethics and, and as I've said there, no good deeds, right, then it's pretty unlikely that you're going to be open to receiving God's love <laughs> for some time yes. probably until you at least have some penitent behaviour for the evil that you've created. But, but the problem with a person who has become moral and ethical and and has good thoughts through their own effort 
-hmm. is that they then believe everything in the future now comes through their own effort. Mm -hmm. And they so also the then, self-reliance issue. So there's this issue of self-reliance that begins to develop. So while moral deeds and good thoughts can potentially cause an awakening of the soul enough for the soul to begin pre to prepare itself for the reception of divine love, mm -hmm. it can also have an opposite effect sometimes, that you now believe you're a pretty good person, you're a pretty moral person, and I'm pretty nifty, really, yes. and I'm pretty good, and I'm, I'm pretty lovely, and yeah. I've done a lot of all on my own effort now. I don't need God now, right? Yeah, yeah. And it can do that too. Yes, it's quite interesting. So, so it can or it may not. It just depends on what happens to the individual and how self-reflective they are about God's existence and the potentiality of a relationship with God as to whether it does have some benefit or not. And this is why I've said, no matter how pure the love becomes, it's not God, divine love and no portion of it. Yes. So no matter how perfected you become as a perfect person, which is God's intention that you become, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you're going to receive God's love. No, it doesn't mean it. And also um, you're not in a transformative process that we talked about yesterday. Well, you're, you're sorry. You're in a self-transformative yes. process you're the to the perfect natural man. The substance of your soul is not, not being altered Correct. to anything to do with God. Yes. Anything so of God. So no element of the divine has entered you. Yes, and, we'll, and, and it cannot enter you just by doing good deeds and having moral thoughts and moral actions and, and being an ethical person. God's love still cannot enter you if you just engage that mm -hmm. without the other things we've discussed. But we could say God approves of that if we're not in a self-reliant state as we're in that process. Of course God approves yes. of it. And that's self-demonstratable by the fact that every person who engages that behaviour to perfection reaches the condition of the perfect natural man. It just, and so it's pretty proof. happy. And, yeah, and that's yeah. proof that God does approve of that. Yeah. But it's not the same as becoming the divine angel. Yeah. It's not, not nothing the same. Yeah. So you can, in, you can even, you know, and this is where I see a lot of uh, people who are, again, often religious, you know, really fire and brimstone about morals, uh, for example, mm -hmm. not realising that the threats that they are putting out there about morals. About immorality. About immorality. Yeah. Which are quite dark threats, you know, threatening, in fact, the death or the eternal damnation of a person. Mm -hmm. Right are actually destroying their own soul condition and destroying their relationship with God at the same time. Yeah, so you're talking about using fear to try and to attempt induce to get someone to morality be moral. in others. Yes. That's actually very immoral is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Using fear as an attempt to control someone's behaviour or even an attempt to get them to do something good. Yeah is in itself bad. Yes. And from God's perspective, will there will be a penalty associated with that upon the soul. Yeah. yeah. So That's many people who are engaged in moral thoughts and moral deeds and becoming a moral person have a large degree of self-righteousness mm -hmm. that they then impose upon their brothers and sisters on the earth, which causes the degradation of their own soul, the person who's doing the imposition, and also upon the soul of anybody who listens to them, unfortunately. Mm. So, you know, these kind of things, again, are not effective in helping a person really grow into a divine being. And the distinction you're making there is a distinction between an ethical and moral state and a self-righteous state. Yes. And if we were really to analyse it, the self-righteousness is not ethical or moral. Not at all. No. Mm. But people can develop in some way in harmony with God's God's feelings about what's ethic and ethical and moral, yes. but maintain a self-reliant and self-righteous and very kind of even angry state about how everyone else should be behaving or, or whatever. And but that well, I don't feel they can maintain that in the long run. You know, in the long run they give up all that. But yeah. but often while they're on earth, this is what they do. They yeah. become ethical and moral themselves, but now they try to impose that upon others by making a whole set of rules which are driven by fears mm -hmm. uh, which they've established through books or such as the bible or the quran or some other book and and then they use that as an evidence that god's going to punish this un immoral behavior and so forth and while it is true that immoral behavior does receive corrective consequences uh you know the truth is what you do so you do reap from mm -hmm. god's perspective while it is true 
at the end of the day, that is still development towards the perfect natural man. That's not development towards a divine angel. And while the, the sorry, just be what is the the corrective process of your morality and ethics? Yes, and the process you engage through that correction is the development to the perfect natural man. Yeah. Now, when you receive God's love and you act in harmony with it, the side effect is that you become more ethical and moral. Right, okay, because I have a follow-up <laughs> question about this. Because yes. you have to pass through the development of the perfect natural man in order to become the divine angel. And when I say pass through, what I mean is that every person who develops to the seventh sphere has at one point entered the sixth. <laughs> because <laughs> the sixth sphere is a dimensional space below the seventh mm -hmm. and the sixth sphere is the perfect natural man. So every person who's receiving divine love eventually passes through the sixth sphere developed state, which means that they are now ethical and moral and they certainly think good deeds, but it's the subsequent result of their reception of God's love rather than being driven only by the moral and ethical requirement. Gotcha, mm. gotcha. So uh, it's logical that God would want us to experience the perfected state that is our kind of base code, yes. you know, the perfected yes. natural person yes. that God created. It's natural that God would want us to experience that at some point, otherwise why create it? Exactly. Like, it's, it's, it's fairly logical, isn't it, when you really think about it. Um, but I get the distinction you're saying there's one way where we are longing for God in all sincerity and we want to do things God's way. And then there's the natural, like the what we often call the natural love way, mm -hmm. which is just a desire to perfect myself in human love and to kind of reach my potential as a human. To reach my um, full potential, yes, as, as a human. As a human alone. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the other way. Yes. Um, just one final question. Will the preparation of my soul that we talked about yesterday, so this desire to correct um, my understanding of what love is, yep. my desire to be more truthful and humble, uh, the the growing the sincerity, the growth prayer, of faith, prayer. The desire for God's love. Will those things naturally cause me to become more moral and ethical before the point that I receive God's love? They can do. But it's not necessarily a given. Not necessarily a given. They can do. Usually a person who is self-reflective, who is sincere, and, and also sincere about their examination of their love-based issues, mm -hmm. normally in that process they do start to examine issues of morality and ethics mm -hmm. as a part of the examination of themselves. Mm -hmm. And usually that's a natural process. So, yeah, it can do. I think that's sort of answered by the next paragraph really right. about the fact that there are some benefits to yes. becoming a more moral and ethical person. And also if you do prepare the soul sincerely for the inflowing of God's love, it's highly likely you're also helping yourself progress morally and ethically as well mm -hmm. without even having yet received God's love mm -hmm. uh, for obvious reasons because you're now being more self-reflective, more concerned about love more more looking at yourself analytical more. Yeah. about how yeah. you ethically you what you demand of others and so forth so now you're starting to be and you're being more humble more mm -hmm. willing to change and developing a desire to connect to god obviously all of these particular things ha ha cause you to want to to grow in the way in which you experience yourself as well as the way you experience god so so obviously that will have some effect yeah on, on you but again, if you just do that alone, yes, this is the distinction. Yeah, then you will still not receive God's love. You, it's got no it, moral practices and natural love alone have no effect on the reception of God's love. Yes, on their own. That's right. They don't. Yeah. And can we say though that immoral practice and unethical behaviour yeah. certainly can have an effect? Yeah, on whether you receive more of God's love or not. Mm. Beautiful segue to the next paragraph. Yes. Let's talk about the paragraph. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, the next paragraph says, Good thoughts and deeds, though, may help to turn the aspirations of the soul to these higher conditions and open up its perceptions to a degree that may lead to prayer and faith. And therefore, in addition to their work of purifying the natural love, may prove to be of great value 
in assisting men towards the development of the soul so that the divine love may enter into it. Mm -hmm. But to depend on good thoughts and moral deeds and a life pure from sin to give man the right to an entrance in the celestial kingdom is a great mistake. Yeah. Yeah. And that's basically a beautiful summary that you gave, Paget, of everything we just talked about. Isn't yeah. It? So, so certainly, like if you choose to live an immoral life and an unethical life, that is going to have a in, tremendous impact upon whether you continue to receive God's love or not. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the main reasons why people who initially receive some of God's love never receive any more of God's love because they are refusing to give up their immoral and unethical behaviours. Yes. Right? And, and that includes their addictions. All addictions are both immoral and unethical. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're not willing to make the changes necessary to receive more of the love. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the soul has to be prepared to receive more love. Yep. It has to find, the love has to find a place of lodgement. A place where it can, where it can maintain stay. itself. Exactly. Yes. And if you're working continuously against the love that you've received, then obviously you're going to eventually degrade your condition so much so that no more love can be received yeah. until you change your operations of sincerity and your operations of definitions of love so that you can prepare the place for the soul to receive the love and it find lodgement and be able to stay there. Mm -hmm. right? Besides the fact that the Holy Spirit itself requires sincerity and truth in order to connect to the soul, there's also these other requirements of whether the love can actually find a lodgement in the soul, yes. as we discussed in our previous session. And so you're saying that part of the way that the love can continue to find lodgement is through um, us elevating our condition in terms of ethics and morality and good thoughts Correct. and deeds. And, and there's also a lot of other benefits to that, mm -hmm. because, uh, because the more moral and ethical we become, the less influenced we are by... Un immoral and unethical people, both whether those people are on earth or unseen in the spirit world, we're less influenced by them. So there's other benefits besides... That's a big benefit. Yeah, that's a huge benefit. <laughs> yeah. But And like I said there, it can be of great value in yeah. assisting men. Like So we, we can't decry the value of moral and ethical development because there is a large value to it, yeah. right? both for the development of the perfect natural man which, and that's essential for that. Yes. But also in terms of preparing the soul for lodgement, mm. for divine love to eventually enter, it's also very important for that. And it's also one of the reasons if a person becomes immoral and unethical, they're working against the love they've received. And yeah. so it can be a source of great pain when they do that. So, yeah. so moral and ethical development is very important yeah. to the human. But as I've said there, it does not give you the right to enter the, the celestial heaven still. Mm -hmm. So while it has helped it you a lot... give you entry at all? No. It, 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 while it's helped you a lot, you will only ever live in the sixth sphere if that's the only thing you engage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So can we just briefly then talk about this first, just to make it a little bit more concrete maybe for our viewers, mm -hmm. This idea that good thoughts and deeds may help to turn the aspirations of the soul towards God and God's love. Yep. Can you think of any examples? I can think of a couple perhaps for myself. Oh, there's billions of examples. Like, you know, <laughs> just every time we look at morals and ethics, let's look at the balance or the equality of man, humankind. Mm -hmm. So exa exa many examples. My soul, from God's perspective, is equal to a child's soul. Mm -hmm. So if somebody beats me and it's called uh, assault, mm -hmm. then ethically that demands that beating a child should be called assault. There's a point of ethics. Yep. Huh? Now, if I understood that point of ethics in my heart, yep. then I would see that if I beat a child, that that's the same as assaulting an adult. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same and should be treated the same and God will treat it probably the same. But before, I'm not, I don't have an aspiration for God yet. I still I'm don't have an aspiration for God. I'm just looking so, at the balance. Yes. I'm, I'm just looking, looking at the balance. balance. Yep. I'm just saying, right, here I am. I'm a person who's considering beating this child. Beating an adult, according to the law, is wrong. And yep. if I look at it, yes, I don't like to be beaten myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
that hurts and I don't like it. Yeah, and it doesn't actually make me feel like more confident to do the right thing the next time, it just makes me feel afraid. Correct, so. correct. It, it, it encourages fear rather than uh, doing, self, some, doing uh, something for a good reason. Yes, then morality and ethics. Correct. Yeah. It encourages my motivation to be fear-based rather than to be love-based. Yeah. So just from a logical perspective, here I am considering beating a child. I would have to ponder and go, okay, no, I don't like to be beaten. I know every time I get beaten, if an adult beat, it, beat, beat me, I'd be pretty scared. Yeah. And if an adult beat me, I'd hurt. And if an yeah. adult beat me, I, like I'd be pretty upset with them probably, and so forth and so forth. Yeah. Therefore, ethics would dictate mm -hmm. that I should not consider beating the child. Yep. And that, that's just a point of ethics. Yep. yep. The beauty of having that analysis yeah. is I'm going, okay, what's fair and what's not fair? Right? right. What's equality? Yeah. I'm working through these issues, right? Yeah. Now, this can help me a lot to understand how someone who is more moral than I, like God, might uh -huh. be if I ever contemplate God. Uh -huh. It can help me understand what God's character would be. Would God punish a person with violence? for example, is a question. Yep. Well, no, because I can see that it's wrong for me to. If it's wrong for me to and I'm just a man, then surely it must be wrong if God did it. Mm -hmm. So God would not punish a person with violence. Now, I then pick up the Bible and I read a chapter in the Bible or a verse in the Bible that says God will burn the evil people with fire yep. in the book of Revelation. I'm going, well, hang on a sec, that's violence. <laughs> Burning someone alive you know, obviously not a good thing, you know, that's pretty violent. I wouldn't like that happening to me. Obviously, God's never going to do that. So this verse in this Bible is wrong. Yep. I can base that based on my logical reasoning ability of the ethics involved. Yep. Huh? Yep. Wrong for me to burn a person. I would not like to be burnt. Yep. Surely God must have a better way of correcting people than burning them, you know and so forth. So, so, so this allows me the ethical consideration, if I did extend it to a consideration of God, if I chose to, mm -hmm. which is a decision that I would make inside of myself to do so, if I did extend it, I could see then things about God. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of ethics. Yes. And is it also the case that because if I, if I considered God being loving, I suppose, there's, there's many different things. I could have more aspiration to, to um, actually connect with God because yeah. my fear is lessened. So let's take that further. Let's yeah. say I go, okay, here I am. I've considered uh, burning a person alive not a good thing, right? <laughs> uh, I've considered that. I know that I would not like to be burnt alive myself. Burning another person alive not a good thing. Obviously, if God does exist then God wouldn't think burning a person alive is a good thing. So it's highly unlikely God's going to do it. Yeah, you, you often use that reasoning, and I, it's hard for me to relate to at times because, because I suppose um, I've seen a lot of people go, well, because I would do this, God would do this. No, no, that... no, see, what I'm saying here is not the I would do it, you would do it thing. It's... I'm saying, would I do it if I was ethical? Yeah, Not would I do it because I'm just mad. Yes. Because <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> say most that. of the time when I'm angry, I am mad and I'm not ethical anymore. Yes. So many people beat their children when they're angry, but afterwards feel bad about it. Right? Mm. They know that it wasn't ethical, mm -hmm. that it wasn't moral, mm -hmm. it wasn't right. They did it though in a rage. Right. Yeah. So, so that's a very different analysis. Yes, you just need a very honest uh, approach to ethics. Don't you? Not only that, you need to consider, would I like the behaviour done to me in this regard? Would yeah. I like to be burnt alive? Yeah. So I'm reading a Bible verse that says God's going to burn alive the wicked. Right? Um, would, would I like to be? You know, because the implication is from even Bible verses that so-called what I've meant to have said is that, you know, there was a separating of the wheat of the weeds and the weeds would be burnt in the mm -hmm. fiery hells of Gehenna. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Wow, like in the, in the fire of Gehenna, like, yeah, there's the implication that if I'm a weed-like person, I'm going to be burnt, like, yeah, uh, uh, that, um, that's how I'm going to be destroyed. That's the implication, right? And many people then misquote that, of course, and then make it even worse than that. But 
But what I'm suggesting is if I read that verse and I'm a logical person, I've got no real belief or no belief about God at this point. I'm just a logical person reading the verse. I can say my consideration of ethics are, is I wouldn't like to be burnt under any circumstances. And mm. I'm pretty sure you wouldn't like to be burnt under any circumstances. And, and, and so, you know, obviously God is probably not going to want to burn us under any circumstances. <laughs> Surely that's a, a, a logical a point of logic. Now, if God is angry, mm -hmm. then maybe he will. Because mm -hmm. I would, if I'm angry, yep. perhaps do that. But then I would have to go, as well if I'm truly ethical, I have to go, hang on a sec. Is a person who's got all this intelligence and all this knowledge, and he's so, you know, supposedly created me and he's got all this, you know, power at his disposal, if he was angry, I'd probably already be dead. Mm -hmm. So it's highly unlikely that this God gets angry. Mm -hmm. So any real verse now that says that God gets angry and that God's going to be in the fury of his rage, he's going to go ahead and do something, I'd read that and go, sorry, that's just not true. Mm. It can't be true because if it was true, God would have already done it. He's not going to wait until, you know, I don't wait when I'm angry. <laughs> you know, when I'm angry, I sort of lose the consideration of everything and I just do it right, right there and then. If God's angry, he would do the same, right? And, you know, there would be this an instant result for, of his rage. Yeah. So, and oh, he's got a lot to be angry about if, if we looked at it from our perspective. And so we'd have to say, well, obviously God doesn't get angry. Yeah. And there's another point of logic. And as I'm applying these points of logic, this can help me have a concept of God that then encourages me to go, wow, if such a God does exist, that who's kind, is not going to burn me alive, he's <laughs> not going to punish me in the tor or torment of hellfire, he's not going to do all of these terrible things to me, and, and he's only trying to educate me, if that is, which is what I'm trying to do with my own child. Right? Mm -hmm. if, if that's his true nature, would I like to know him? See, that might help me mm. come to the point of wanting to know him mm -hmm. if I have that analytical discussion. Mm. But if I don't analyse it like that and I just read a verse in the Bible that says a certain thing and believe it, mm -hmm. now I'm going to be very judgmental about this God. Right? And so you could say that many holy books that are written on the earth are actually blasphemous mm -hmm. towards God. Mm -hmm. They're even blasphemous towards logic and blasphemous towards ethics. And we can't really say enough about that. So while I don't want to offend all the religions of the earth, <laughs> the reality is many of the holy books are blasphemous. And, and this is one of the problems, is if people then take up a blasphemous belief system mm -hmm. and then engage it as if it's truth, mm -hmm there is a high likelihood of there being some disastrous consequences. Yeah. And yeah. that's why we have disastrous consequences on the planet. Mm. Most of our wars, in fact, are caused by religion historically and are fought on religious basis. And, and most of our child abuse occurs, if I, if I take child abuse as just beating a child, occurs almost universally mm -hmm. in most religions you know, we can see that we've got a lot of problems we need to fix. Yeah. 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 And, and religion, believing books that portray this behaviour as God approval, with God's approval, are not helping us change the behaviour. And really what you're trying to say there is that they are doing the opposite of encouraging people to have an aspiration. To a, God's an God. In God. fact, yeah. if anything, what they do is encourage everyone to be angry with God. Yeah. 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 which obviously then inside of oneself, if you're angry with somebody, it's highly unlikely you're going to desire a relationship mm. with them. Mm. It's high, high, highly unlikely you're going to be even caring about whether you would even have a relationship with them. You wouldn't want one. Mm -hmm. Highly unlikely you would consider having a relationship with a being that is willing to exterminate a large proportion of the earth at some point in the future. Right? Yeah. So, so... You know, they all, all the Bible verses portray me as coming with a sword and destroying the wicked and so forth. Well, you know, in some ways I'm coming with a sword in the sense of separating truth from error, if that's what the sword is doing. But if the sword's 
killing people, no, that's never going to happen, never was going to happen, mm. and would never happen with God's approval. Mm. And, and so these verses are all terrible, terrible lies that then get imposed upon God's character. Yeah, and I, but I suppose what I see also is that there are terrible lies and there are certain people, many of them in Australia, who believe that is a bunch of lies and that's a terrible, terrible thing. But then people kind of go into this um, backlash of, you know, you've had, you've well, kind of, in this life. of unethical behaviour. In this, yeah, and that's, that's, so I suppose um, in this life, I've had a lot of contact with people in, say, a new age kind of a circle. Mm -hmm. And their analysis of God, if they even say the word God, is often to do with what makes them comfortable. Mm. And they call that ethical. Um, but and it's not. It's not. No. So, so it seems to me that even to develop in natural love, which is what you're talking about in this paragraph, yeah. we have to have some level of humility, don't we? And to sincerity in our analysis, an analysis of ethics. Of <laughs> ethics and ourselves, yes. don't we? Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, frequently, like what... As uh, some book, other books have said, you know, the, the Robert James Lee's material, one of the quotes in there that Afra wrote, he says, he says that, you know, frequently we condemn in another something that we accept in ourselves. Mm. So that's not ethical. Yeah. Now, you know, most people on the earth, unfortunately, do that. Mm -hmm. and, and if you want to progress towards even the perfect natural man, You've got to stop doing that. Yeah. You've got to not condemn in another that you will something you will accept in yourself. Yes. You'll need to accept it in both. Yeah. Or condemn it in both. Yeah. You know, obviously. Yeah. If, well, depending and there upon is that, whether it's loving or not. There is that issue as well, isn't there, where people do, are very self-condemnatory and condemnatory towards others. others in a way that is not in harmony with the way God views things. No, but now we're there? now we're not talking about ethics. We're now talking about morals. Ethics is a balanced way of dealing with everything. So in other words, if I condemn something in you, I should condemn the same thing in me. Yep. If I approve of something in you, I should approve of the same thing in me. Yes. Uh, that's ethics. Yep. Morals is what does God say I should yep. approve of? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does God say I should, uh, yep. you know, think is right and what, and what is wrong? That, that's a different, uh, obviously yep. a different consideration. Yep. Most people on this planet are not even ethical. Yeah. That, and they've got no approach towards morals. And that, that applies to most religious people. There's very little morals, actual morals, God's viewpoint of what is moral yeah. in religious people on this planet. Yeah. And there is also very little appreciation of ethics in religious people on the planet, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. because they will frequently take an action that they themselves would not want another to take. Mm -hmm. So under the same circumstances. Yeah, and this is them. why yeah. I said the golden rule in the first yeah. century, you know, yeah. and that is the a golden rule of ethics, you know. Mm -hmm. But but so, of course, even with all that, <laughs> we're still not receiving God's yeah. love. <laughs> I, and if we get back to my original question, which was really about how good thoughts and deeds may help turn the aspiration. So my aspiration, my desire. Mm -hmm. Um, and I gave an example to, of that, which you weren't happy with. Yeah, no, no, I was, I was going to say, you've given us one example, yeah. but uh, I was happy. <laughs> but I, I feel like um, it's good to engage with the... Um, what I notice <clears throat> is, um, in my own life, <laughs> what are you laughing at? That's all right. <laughs> You're going on your own life, yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 there's so many thoughts because... Um, uh, now I'll put you off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess you have a very good analytical mind. And well, an, an analytical <laughs> mind. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm starting on another subject yeah, that right. you just want to say what you want to say. Yeah. Say what you want to say. No, talk about the analytical mind. Well, it's important. to me, an analytical mind uh, comes through a, a, a true... Um, sincere analysis of logic, right? Yes, and that's what I mean. And most people are not capable of sincere logic because of the emotional injuries that they have and that prevents them from using sincere logic 
you know, logic that's not where you're not trying to weasel your way <laughs> through things. Get you reason to where you want to go. Yes, yeah. on this planet, there is a, there's, it's almost like people enjoy debate because it helps them weasel around, you know, manoeuvre around issues of truth rather than actually try to find issues of truth. Mm. So it depends on your intention. So there's a difference between debate and resolution. Of course. The, the, the intention of an ethical person is not to debate, but rather to find the truth. Mm -hmm. That's to, the intention. To resolve the truth. And yeah. to resolve what the truth yeah. actually is. The, now, most people on the planet are taught from a very young age to avoid the truth and to use so-called reasoning, which is frequently very flawed, mm -hmm to arrive at a point where they don't have to or they do have to do something that they shouldn't do mm -hmm. you know or they don't have to do something that they should do they use this so-called logic which is not logic at all but a desire like a, it's almost like a legal desire you know like many forms of legality nowadays are not interested in finding the truth they're just interested in getting a person off the hook yeah. Off, off of being, out of being punished. Mm -hmm. And this is frequently how we have learnt in our childhood to use so-called reasoning to get us off the hook. Yeah. Now, that's not a, the, a true use of logical reasoning. Yeah. Logical reasoning is not about putting a person on the hook or letting them off the hook. It's about arriving at the truth of a matter. Yeah. Right? And arriving at the truth so that the truth satisfies every point of contention right, in a logical manner. Now, now I feel uh, ethics and morale, proper use of ethics does that, uh, yeah. which of I, course I, then I opens you to that. sincerity and therefore opens you further to God. Yes. That's the beauty of it. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So perhaps my example does fall within that uh, line of reasoning, really. Yep. Um, Which is? But it's just that I don't engage my intellect in the analysis of what occurs for me as much as what. So I couldn't have sat down eight years ago yeah. and thought, logically, the way my family is treating Jesus is it's not ethical because this, I don't need to go into the big long story. But can I point out but why I you did could? feel that. Yes. I did feel that and it caused me to take certain actions. Action. So I had a boyfriend in the past yes. who's, um, because of his religious faith in his family, yep. I was a persona non grata. I was never introduced to them. I was all excluded and he would go and see them and I had to wait, you know, at the bus stop while oh. he did that. Yep. And because I'd had that experience, perhaps, um, See, I could reason. So this experience did actually cause you to realise what would feel ethical. Yes. So th that's what I was saying. Perhaps it does. Yes. Uh, but so when I met you and my parents really would like, would have liked me and said, well, they said a number of things they didn't mean, but really what they would have liked is for me to visit them without you. Yes. And to exclude And they still you. want you to do that. I'm sure. Well, who knows? I think they're not they're not that happy with me anyway. But um, I could then ethically say, uh, okay, that doesn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. I can't accept this mm -hmm. way that they want me to interact. Mm -hmm. So I changed some of my my thoughts and deeds, mm -hmm. basically. Hmm. So you wouldn't allow the unethical behaviour because it, you could feel that you had had a previous experience. Yes. Which has actually established that the behaviour was unethical. Yes. So now that you've had a previous experience that established the behaviour was unethical, you applying the same rule to yourself. Yes. Which was a point of sincerity. You know, if you weren't sincere, you wouldn't have applied the same rule. Certainly. But it was a point of sincerity. You you were sincere. You applied the same rule to yourself and you said, well, I can't impose what was imposed upon me in the past and it wasn't good. I can't impose that upon another person. Yes. And I felt strongly about that. In yeah. fact, I wasn't very clear on anything else, but I knew I felt that this was a point of problem. Now, the so, question becomes... No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay, you go. 
You go, but I want to come back. If okay, I can. Yeah. yeah. If you can remember, can you remember? I can remember point? what I want to say. Yeah. The question becomes: If you had not had the previous experience, and if you had not ever been treated unethically before, could you have still determined that what your parents were demanding of you was around it was unethical? That's a good question. I th I'd like to think that I would. And I think there are certain other areas in my life Can where I, say, I have reason to be. You only that. will under certain circumstances. Yes. The circumstances are usually related to the amount of pain that they put you under, mm -hmm. usually. And this is where people's viewpoint of ethics is severely distorted. If you, pressure is placed upon a person, frequently they give up their ethics. So frequently they know what is wrong but refuse to do it because they don't want to endure the pain that will result from being ethical. Now, in your family, there is a pain that results from being ethical. <laughs> it was fairly painful, that experience that yes. I went through. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, yes. Yes. And they put a lot of pain on you to try and force you to not be ethical. Yeah. But because of your previous experience, you were quite firm on this point of ethics with them. Right? Yes. Well, it's a, I have a similar soul to you. Yeah. And so of when course. I can see an issue of truth, it does, I, I don't yeah. let it go. Yeah. Yes. So now that this was the case, now that this was the case, you could see that it was easy for you to determine what was ethical and what was not. Yep. Because of the previous experience. Mm -hmm. And you were willing to endure the pain coming upon you from your family mm -hmm. and still choose the ethical experience. Yep. You were willing to do that. Yeah. The average person on the planet isn't. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. As in they, um, whether they've had a previous experience of it or, or, not. or not, you're saying they're willing to give up ethics if the pain, there's a pain threshold. Yes. And for some people I can see it's quite a low pain threshold. Very low. For some it's quite high. Yeah. But you're basically saying people will give up their ethics. Yes. And yes. obviously that's not development in even natural love, is it? Well, it's also not being sincere. Because if you were truly sincere, you would go, hang on a sec, I wouldn't like to be treated this way. So I can't, I can't abide you being treated this way. Yes. So you're talking about this quality of sincerity here. Is this the same sincerity yes. that we need when we talked about the preparation of the soul yesterday? Yes. And this is the beauty of engaging ethics in a, with a, in a firm way, mm -hmm. is that it does cause you to be far more sincere. And being sincere is a part of the preparation of the soul in order to receive God's love. Yeah. So, so, so growing almost sincerity is a quality, mm -hmm. whether we're sincere about uh, whatever, it, whatever it is, whether I'm even sincere about ethics or I'm sincere about wanting to go to the supermarket or yeah. whatever. Sincere about anything. It's a quality, you're saying, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That can be developed and needs to be developed if you want to have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And living in harmony with ethics can create sincerity. Yeah. Can that, mm. Things that you wouldn't have been sincere about before, you are now sincere about. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the beauty of these kind of experiences is they can... So you could say that experience has opened your soul more to be able to receive God's love. Well, that was how I... That was my question, really, or my comment, was that I can see now in hindsight mm -hmm. that that experience has opened me is, is part of my preparation yeah because i'm your soul's preparation but what i'm noticing lately is and i wanted to raise this for the benefit of our viewers yeah. because i understand they're in a process as well that what i'm noticing lately is that i wasn't conscious of how all of these things were forming a part of my preparation until very recently it's only recently that I feel I'm more actively, consciously engaged in this preparation process, and yet mm. I was engaged in it through this development in ethics and morality. Yes. And... And that's frequently the case, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's frequently the case that we look back 
and can see things that we didn't see at the time. Of course. And and frequently the case that we went by a feeling that we trusted because, uh -huh. and, and, and if you think about it, the feeling of ethics is this. If I feel bad inside of myself about having something done to me, uh -huh. then should I do that same thing to another? Uh -huh. Now, that's really the ethics you applied in this uh, situation. I also, I also weighed up whether there was validity in the viewpoint, as in I wasn't, I wasn't a nasty person in the situation with my ex-boyfriend and you were not a nasty person. So I couldn't even see any grounds for any kind of exclusion. Or So it wasn't just that it felt bad for me mm -hmm. because I might have been a nasty person and they might have said, I don't want that woman here, yeah. you know, yeah. and in which case I but would have said... if they'd never met you, they'd never had the chance to know. They so had never had the chance to know. Mm -hmm. But my family had met you. Yeah, and they have frequently allowed me to stay in their own home. So Yeah, you were okay point. with them until, <laughs> until we got we together. Mm -hmm. And so I could reason on a couple of fronts because they started to tell me, that you're a very nasty person <laughs> and very, very nasty. And, but I could say, well, no, I can't see any evidence for that. So it wasn't just and that I... And I live with him now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, any so I think I'm better qualified to know. <laughs> exactly. um, uh, I couldn't see... So there was a couple of points of ethics there for me, it felt like. Yes, but or what more, I'm saying... Is that morality? I don't know. What I'm saying to you, though, is in each case, you did emotionally feel it. Yes, and that's what I wanted to and draw. And I feel that when we talk about ethics frequently, and this is what I notice with a lot of women that's when we talk about raise. ethics, they frequently think it's an intellectual process, but actually many times it, it can be the ethics are, is an emotional process. Mm. It, it is an emotional process of emotionally would I like this done to me. If I wouldn't like this done to me, then emotionally I can't engage in behaviour that would do it to somebody else, mm -hmm. right? And even if I felt like I di did want to, you know, that I wanted to engage yeah. in that behaviour, I would have to somehow restrict myself from doing it because I just feel like there's something wrong here. I've got to deal with that, whatever yeah. that thing is. Yeah. And, and, you know, many women do have these feelings. Uh, with men, it's usually a bit more of an intellectual bit of a process with regard to what's ethical. Uh, in that th their feelings are sometimes less involved. And that is a problem for the men. Yeah. Because frequently they again, they, they then use legalistic argument for bad behaviour yeah. rather than actually feeling what would that feel like from being done to me. Yeah. And that, that, you know, so in some ways, if women tune more into this uh, feeling-based uh, process that they mm -hmm. have, they would probably find that that ethical decisions would could be you know just as easily made and, and often more easily made than what a man who's detuned from his emotions could make yes mm. and this is so my original example was going to be about me and my relationship with fear and this is a good mm -hmm. example following on from what you've just been discussing with me so i can feel now that me changing my relationship towards my fear and how I deal with it. So many times, as you know, over the years, I've felt if I get afraid, that's grounds for me to treat you in a very unethical manner. Mm. I, I'm allowed to be angry. I'm allowed to shut you off. I'm allowed to, you know, decide I don't even want anything to do with you because I'm terrified now, yeah. you know. And, and it might mean not even me that caused your fear. It, nothing in fact, to frequently it's do not. with you, usually. <laughs> usually. Usually somebody else threatened you or something. It's something in our environment mm. that's that I'm feeling frightened of. Mm. Yeah. And so um, I've seen, and I, this is an issue for many women as well, this fear mm -hmm. issue and what we Causes many permit women to be in unethical. ourselves, in, <laughs> yes, when, when fear is triggered in, within us. Yes. So I've seen that point of ethics for a long time mm -hmm. with my intellect, but it's only recently where I feel a sincere aspiration to change that uh, way that I'm dealing with fear, mm -hmm. in that I'm not dealing with fear. Mm -hmm. um, so and, that's, and that's occurred through different, again, yeah. God's helpers, God's, you know, instrumentalities yeah. demonstrating to you the negative consequences of hot, of living by your fears rather yes. than basing it on more ethical choices. Yes. Mm. And through that process, though, it has to be emotional for me, it feels, 
because through that process, I now start to become more sensitive to where I have been harmed when women around me have not wanted to experience that. True, I'm not saying the decision-making process logically is not emotional. No, I know you're saying that very clearly it is. Yeah, because every, emo every logical choice has to have emotional logic applied to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but going right, right back to yeah. what I was att uh, attempting to ask more about was that the good thoughts and deeds, they help to turn our aspirations of the soul to the higher conditions. Mm -hmm. But it does feel a little bit mysterious to me how that happens. Like, that's mm -hmm. why I commented on your analytical brain because I often feel I lack when I'm in those emotional states and I'm just like, no, this is wrong. No, I've got to do this thing. I lack the intellectual analysis. But then years down the track, I go, that was totally... And now I have more faith that if I continue to honour ethics and morality mm -hmm. and aspire to... I, I think you're sort of getting off track a bit because it, okay. there are so many things that can influence you to say, no, something is wrong. Well, There's your right. own emotional state and <laughs> yeah. there are all the instrumentalities that God uses. Yeah, okay. So it can be your own emotional state. Yeah. But it can also be that something happened to you before along those that vein and you As didn't you like it. Yeah. Or, or it can also be that you've, you've got God's thought yeah. communicating with your thoughts saying, no, this is wrong. Yeah. It could also be a spirit saying, no, actually, Mary... You know what you're thinking you're doing here that's not right yeah. or no you know what that's doing there is not right you yeah. know you've got to do it this way yeah it could also so it can be many things yeah that cause it way back in that moment and each one of those things is like an instrument that god can use to help prepare the soul yes so i'm not saying just ethical logic is going to help prepare the soul there's as we said in our previous session there's literally thousands of different ways mm -hmm. that God and th thousands of different things God can use to help prepare our soul to actually get into a condition where we firstly start to apply ethics in our lives when we didn't before. Yes. But then that also helps us then move to, to want a new condition, these higher conditions. To want the higher condition yeah. and want the ethical behavior and start to understand ethics and start to understand even morals, you know, because every little change we make is like a pivot point for the next change and, and so. i suppose it must be the operation of the laws because even though that experience say with my family was very painful there was obviously another reward for me in that i kept yeah not only that there's the previous pain associated with being in a relationship with a guy who frequently could discard you just yeah. for the sake of his family yeah which obviously you hadn't fully felt, yeah. but you had at least felt some of. Yeah. And so therefore able to see that, oh, that just doesn't feel good for me. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I meant just my desire to keep going and keep aspiring for a higher state, even though everyone in my life was basically saying, Dang. you are an idiot yes. and what you're doing is harmful and wrong. Yeah. There was still a continued aspiration um, so even though I was bringing myself more in harmony with morals and ethics, it was painful and everyone opposed me, there was something else causing me to continue to aspire. Well, no, there's an internal joy yes. that comes yes, that's what I was from meaning. standing up morally and ethically, even in amongst yeah. painful situations. So this is another way that, that we God. that we grow our aspirations. Well, not only, yes, another instrumentality of God in a way. Yes. In that in the, we get the internal sense of well-being, yeah. which is often a very powerful motivator by taking action that's loving mm -hmm. and in harmony with ethics and morality. So this is another powerful motivator, which often is stronger motivation than external attack is a, a detriment mm -hmm. yes yeah so yeah there's a whole it's... heap of things that can change our aspirations of course and i think you know people need in, in the discussion of this obviously we're focusing on the perception of god's love here but in the discussion of this and we, when we talk about it there are so many things again you could spend a whole year discussing individual things right that yeah. can motivate a person and it's only as you also point out it's only often as we look back Mm. We've developed to a point now where we really like ethics and we really think it's important yeah. so that this is a growth 
a point of growth. Yeah. We get to that point and we're going, wow, it's so important now to be ethical. I want to know all about ethics and how to apply ethics. And now we start to apply that logical reasoning. Yeah to more situations in our lives, rather, as you did with the issue of fear. Yes. Before then, when I first met you, fear, fear no was way. just a no-go. Like fear, <laughs> yeah. fear, Mary what was fear? always unethical. <laughs> <laughs> what fear? I'm just allowed to be like this yeah. and Mary, control Mary, everything. When, when Mary's afraid, she's always allowed to be unethical. Yeah. Internally, you yeah. know, that, that was pretty much the case when I met you. Yeah. But now, after all the other things that you know, that you've made, that's no longer the case. Now mm. you're often afraid but you go, no, there's a point of ethics here that I need to follow, and so you follow it. Yeah. And so this is all indicators of growth. And like I said, there's so many instrumentalities that help growth to prepare the soul to the reception of God's love. Mm -hmm. But even amongst all of that, it's still not receiving God's love unless yep. the primary conditions are satisfied. Are satisfied. Mm -hmm. and, and theoretically... Eight years ago, if I had have changed some other things in terms of being willing and desirous to long for love, I may not have been in such a long preparatory process. Correct. Yes. But if you also analyse yourself eight years ago, you were very self-protective when it came to love because of your childhood situation and so many severe demands placed upon you and also a mixture of the memories that you had yeah. from first century life about having had lost love and so forth. And so you had quite a lot of opposition to opening your heart to love, mm -hmm. even love of God in that ca case. Yeah. So, so you can see that that's also a preparatory thing that's occurred yes. over years too. Yes. So, so it's, very, um, it's very important, I feel, that people don't condemn themselves for the past behaviour because frequently we look back on the past and we go, yeah, but I didn't know that and I didn't know this and I didn't understand that and I didn't get that and I didn't... You know, there's yeah. so many things we didn't get. And as long as we're willing to keep engaging in this sincere manner, mm -hmm. you know, this real strong desire for truth, which is something you you know you have, and, and something that everyone is going to have to develop, obviously, if they want to receive God's love and prepare their soul to receive God's love, and be humble enough to reflect upon it, then and, and as long as that happens, then sooner or later the soul will be prepared to receive. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's a beautiful thing, how God's done that. And the key is to not go back over the past so much in, in, in terms of uh, trying to condemn oneself or say, oh, I wish I knew that then, you know, because there are areas of our life that we know things. And then there's areas of our life that we have no knowledge whatsoever due to a whole heap of circumstances and situations. And, and we need to have some faith in God that God's just pulling us through these areas and as long as we engage the principles and it, so if anything if if, the, if there is anything that is to regret it's only that we weren't trusting of God enough to just go through the principles as they come up <laughs> yeah and you I, know and we often delay that process yeah you know. and I feel so much more trust now um, of God yeah that that he's got I, you in hand I'm so grateful yeah. for that preparatory process that yeah. I've been going through. I yeah. feel every event is just such a gift to help me and I feel far more trusting now yeah. that, like you said, God's got me in hand. I just need to trust the next. Yeah. and But it's taken time even to trust that God's got you in hand because yes. you can see, you can see again from childhood, frequently we don't feel our parents have really got a loving hand, <laughs> you know, with us, you know. Yeah. And so it's very hard for us then to presume that God would have a loving hand. And it's only, again, through different things that happen and different procedures, you know, different things we go through that we eventually come and arrive at the decision and go, oh, yeah, maybe God does actually have my progress and my welfare more in hand than anyone else, than anyone else. has. I think for me, I definitely believe that I believe that my parents did have a loving hand but as a result, that made me feel that love was not a very nice thing. You know, I, I yeah, well, felt that, that that's about evil and love, isn't, isn't it? it? Is that yeah. the, their yeah. definition of love was a certain type of love that was very um, it was a certain demanding way, yeah. and uh, oppressive. Yeah, and and uh, and I, and many children would grow up feeling the same from their own parents. And so now there's a feeling with God that maybe when we talk about love, we're really saying that God's going to be demanding and oppressive. Yeah. And, and once we go through certain experiences with God, we start really, oh, 
maybe God's not demanding and oppressive. Yeah. And then, then that opens our heart to the possibility again of having a relationship with God, even though we've been hurt by other people with regard to how they've loved us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. So perhaps that's a good place for us just to have a pause because yeah. I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure our, uh, our, our recorders there need to go through. And then uh, we sort of change the subject now again, doesn't it, this message? Yes. Into uh, talking now specifically about the divine love and what it does and 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 prayer in particular the yeah. operation of prayer so so we talked a lot about you know in the very first of this message this the first one we talked a lot about the nature of who we are and what we are yeah. and then we talked about the preparatory process and now we're about to talk about the the goods yes so we'll come back in a minute <laughs> yeah. and yeah. do that thanks darling <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>